Hi, welcome to my channel. I'm Amanda Sue, and today we are talking about the concept of the ego, the highest self or spiritual self, and Don Miguel Ruiz's concept of domestication. So on my channel, I am exploring some different spiritual concepts, specifically from the New Thought lens. So New Thought is a school of thought that is based in Christianity and has a more spiritual but not religious type of vibe. So one of the things that's really attractive about New Thought to me is I spent a lot of time reading all of these different spiritual books that talked about these concepts that all seemed kind of similar, but I didn't know what to call it, right? Like I wasn't really studying Buddhism, but it was kind of Buddhist-ish in some of the books that I read. And it wasn't really psychology necessarily because it had more of a spiritual lens. So when I was trying to go deeper into some of these concepts, I didn't really know what to call it or what to search for. Because if you search for stuff like spiritual, you can get a huge wide range of different things. So new thought is the thought process, the um, religion in a way, I guess, but not really. Um, it's the, the school of thought, I guess. It's the methodology and the structure and the framework that I follow. So that's where I'm coming from. And today we're going to talk about concepts that you hear from psychology books to spiritual books to new thought books called the ego. Okay, so I want to start by talking about the concept of domestication. Now, this is used a lot in the work of Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote a book called The Four Agreements. If you haven't read it, it's a great one. I would highly recommend checking it out. So throughout all of his different books, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz talks about this concept of domestication. And essentially what he's talking about is how when we're born into the world, our parents' job is to essentially domesticate us, similar to how you would domesticate an animal. And what that means is that when we were born, we didn't get to choose what language we spoke. We didn't get to choose what country or state we lived in. We didn't get to choose what the predominant culture was around us. We didn't get to choose whether or not to go to school or how we were educated or what we learned about. So domestication is essentially the process by which we are assimilated into the culture that's around us. It's this set of rules about what is acceptable behavior and what is not acceptable behavior. Now, some parents are probably pretty intentional about the way that they domesticate their kids and others, not so much. But however we were raised in childhood, we essentially absorbed these ideas that there were right things and wrong things for us to do. The way that we learned is different in different scenarios, but a lot of the time it's based on this idea of reward and punishment. But it's not necessarily that, oh, if you get a good grade, you get a dollar type of reward. Sometimes the reward is people's emotions or the way that they interact with us. So for example, if your parents didn't really pay much attention to you when you were trying to play a new song on the piano or when you did a good job in that video game, but they did pay a lot of attention to you and congratulate you and tell all of their friends when you got a good grade or when you scored the touchdown at the football game. That's a way that we become domesticated. So the attention of our parents is how we perceive love when we're young. And so whatever is able to get our parents' attention, that is a reward. So this is why some kids have a habit or a kind of this pattern where they act out or rebel or do something crazy or wild or destructive because they get that behavior reinforced when their parents show them attention. So if a child is starved for attention, starved for love, and the only way that they can get it is by acting out, well, they learn to act out. And it doesn't matter what the parent or what society says about you shouldn't do that because they're getting that inherent reward of getting attention. And so as we get older, we also get domesticated by our peers. So if, for example, in our adolescence, maybe we're 11, 12 years old, we're starting to explore our own style and we put together this outfit that we think is really cool and we love it, but then we go to school and we get made fun of for it. Well, that's like a punishment and that's another form of domestication. So essentially because we get made fun of or teased, we decide, okay, well, I'm not going to wear that anymore. So over time, we essentially learn to suppress some of the naturalness of who we are and start building some of these layers around how we're supposed to show up in the world. Now, some of this is really necessary. There is a reason that there are socially acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. And so some of it is helpful. 
but other of it can be harmful to kind of our inner psyche and our inner sense of who we are. If we feel like we can't show up 100% authentic as who we are, then we're starting to suppress parts of ourselves. But either way, even if things go, you know, mostly smoothly, we don't have any big trauma that we are dealing with, we didn't have any big events that really hurt us or damaged us in some way, let's just say we had just kind of a normal, easygoing childhood. Even in that case, we had, were still domesticated. And a lot of times we don't realize the way in which we were domesticated until we get into our late 20s or 30s and start doing some of this inner growth, personal development and spiritual work. So essentially the concept of domestication is our habits, our behaviors, our ways of looking at the world and what we believe that were not consciously chosen by us, but were kind of absorbed from the world around us. So Charles Fillmore, one of the co-founders of the Unity Movement, the way that he titled this was personality and individuality. So personality was essentially Don Miguel Ruiz's concept of domestication. It is the stuff that we learn. It is the outer appearance of who we are. It is the ingrained patterns and habits and behaviors that we learn through our upbringing and from the culture around us. Individuality, on the other hand, is our true essence, our spiritual self, that part of us that is, that is truly who we are, that can never be harmed or hurt or changed, that is sometimes buried underneath some of these other layers. Now, in popular psychology and in some spiritual circles, you might hear, hear this referred to as the term ego. Now, ego, the way we use it in just regular conversation, is a lot different than the way we mean it spiritually and the way that we mean it in psychology. So you might hear somebody say something like, oh, he's got a big ego, or like, look at the ego on that guy. So that's referring to somebody who is like full of themselves and thinks they're so great and has kind of this inflated sense of self-worth or maybe has some narcissistic tendencies. That's not what I mean when I say ego. So ego is a term used in psychology. It's also a term used in spiritual circles. And I'd like to do a little bit of myth busting because if you're here, I'm guessing you've heard of the term ego as kind of this exterior mask or personality as Charles Fillmore called it. It's the human part of ourselves or maybe even the parts of our brain that's against us and trying to protect us and keep us small and not allowing us to flourish as spiritual beings. So the ego kit's kind of a bad rap for that reason, but I wanna to talk to you about what the ego is in psychology because we're essentially using it the same way in spirituality, but we're not giving it its full due. So in psychology, the concept of the ego is essentially our self-concept or our self-identity. Ego just means it is the set of ideas that form who we think that we are separate from the rest of the world. This is a very important part of our psychological development. So the ego develops in early childhood, usually around the age of like five, six, seven. And so this is interesting because I don't know if you've had this experience, but if you've ever been around like a toddler and they're throwing a fit, like crying and wailing and they're so upset about whatever, there's sometimes this moment where they like look at you with almost this like confused look on their face. Have you ever noticed that before? So they're crying and wailing and they kind of look at you like, it's because before the ego is developed, we do not see ourselves as separate from the rest of the world. Where I end and where you begin, that is a foreign concept before our ego develops. So for a toddler throwing the tantrum, they look at you confused because they're like, why are you not screaming and crying too? We're upset right now. When they're upset, they think the entire world is upset. They think it is everything. They don't see the distinction between them and somebody else. So the ego for many reasons is an important part of our development. Even what we would call some of the negative or undesirable parts of our ego are important too. So for example, things like acting out in anger about stuff, that comes from our ego, our emotions and our ego. And we can say like, oh, well, I don't wanna act angry, I wanna be all peace and love all the time. Well, in order to get there, we have to stop villainizing the ego because the ego probably has a really good reason for acting out in anger. Maybe over time as your ego developed, it realized that if you're not loud and verbal and intense about how you're feeling, that your emotions are going to get ignored and they're not gonna be taken care of. 
So a lot of these habits, whether it's the way that we think about certain things, the way that we handle our emotions, or the way that we show up in the world, are coming from the ego's best intention to protect us. Now in spiritual circles, we usually talk about the ego as a bad thing, like Oh, that's just your ego trying to protect itself. And the biggest threat to the ego is um, is oneness, is spiritual consciousness. And so it tries to stop you from developing in that way. Well, let's not look at it like the villain. That's a pretty human uh, desire to always have a good guy and a bad guy. So rather than making them levels, like here's the human ego part of ourselves. Here's our personality. Here's our domestication. And then here's my highest self. Um, my Christ consciousness, my true self, my spiritual nature, and they're like at war with each other, let's get a little more holistic view of that. So the ego developed for a purpose and it developed to try and protect us or to try and help us function in the world. It serves a very important role. When we start bumping up against our ego, what that is a sign of is a sign of growth and change. What we used to do, what we used to believe, our old habits, our old way of showing up in the world is no longer serving us. And that makes sense. I am not who I was at 16 years old, definitely not doing what I thought I would be doing at 16 years old. My habits aren't the same, my interests aren't the same, and my way of thinking is not the same. So just as our physical brain develops and doesn't reach maturity until it's 25, our ego is also developing and maturing throughout our lives as well. There's not a point at which our ego reaches full maturity the way we think about it with our brain, but just like with our brain, we're constantly forming new neural pathways, we're constantly learning new things, and our ego is constantly changing and developing as well. But in spiritual circles, what we really wanna get to is the capital S self, the spiritual self, the part of ourselves that is more than our domestication, more than our ego, more than these patterns of behavior. So a really interesting concept that I'm starting to learn about is called internal family system, IFS. And it's a modality of psychotherapy and a way of understanding the mind that has been emerging and evolving since the 80s or 90s. And essentially what this says is that the ego is composed of multiple parts of ourself. And so there might be a protector, there might be an inner critic, there might be a part of you that's hypervigilant, there might be a part of you that does all of these different roles, right? And these roles essentially have been, have become what they are because of our experiences throughout our life. Internal family system says that there is also underneath all of those roles, there is a core part that is our self. In IFS, they call it capital S self, which honestly is what I call it in a spiritual sense most of the time also, capital S self, or highest self, true self, spiritual self, the real me, the I am, or the Christ self, or the Christ consciousness. So depending on what spiritual framework you're working with, you might call it different things, but it's essentially this idea that there is something, there's something about us that is eternal, that is bigger than this 3D world, that's bigger than our body, bigger than our mind, that will survive after we die. Some people may call it consciousness itself. Um, Consciousness is such a hard concept to really put um, any type of, of boundaries or define in any way, but you could call it consciousness, I suppose. Essentially what it is, is this idea that we're more than this body, right? And I remember being like a kid, like 10, 11, 12, 13 maybe, And I remember going through this thought process of like, what makes me, me? Maybe this was the development of my ego or a change in my ego. So I was thinking about this and what I thought about was, okay, like if I didn't have this hand, I'd still be me, right? Like if I lost my hand, I'd still be me. What if I lost my leg? I'd still be me. What if I only had one kidney? If I lost a kidney, I'd still be me. So essentially what I was trying to do was to figure out like, what is me? Like what, what part of me is actually me, the way that I understand myself to be me. And so I go through this whole process, like, well, if I didn't have a lung and if I didn't have my hair and if I didn't have an ear, right? And then I get to the brain. If I didn't have my brain, would I still be me? That's where we get really caught up, right? because we are very identified in our current modern culture with our thinking nature. We're very identified with our brain. And of course, our brain pretty much powers and regulates our entire body and our entire system. So of course that makes sense. We can't live without a brain. But imagine one day that there were brain transplants. Would you still be you? 
even with a different brain or part of your brain was replaced? What if it was 3D printed? Who knows? So we are very identified with our brains, but the idea of a spiritual self or a higher self transcends even our brains. So I want to start us to get start us looking at the idea that our ego is mostly a mental concept. It's something that happens and occurs in our mind. It's patterns and behaviors of thinking that we've developed over time. But there's a part of ourself that is bigger than even that. And by bigger, I mean it's more inherent, it's more natural, it's that spiritual part of ourselves. It's the part of ourself that can never be hurt or harmed or affected. It's the light, the light within us. So what I find interesting is that in internal family systems, which is, I mean, by and through, it's a psychological concept, right? It is it is used in therapy to help people with a wide range of um, things like bulimia and anorexia, um, depression, suicidality. It's used in a lot of ways in with really great results. And so it is a scientific, you know, testing type model that has come out that says that there is this part that is the true self, the capital S self. What it also says in IFS is that part that is our true self cannot be harmed by trauma, does not change, is essentially us at our core, and has an inner wisdom and an inner knowledge of how to find wholeness and how to help all of the parts of our ego exist in harmony together. So I think that's pretty cool because this is a, a psychological foundation, right? This is something that people getting PhDs in psychology are studying now. And it almost has this like spiritual essence to it, right? That there's something more than our physical bodies, including our brain. So this true self or capital S self, our spiritual self or our Christ consciousness, this transcends our body, it transcends our mind, it transcends time and space, it transcends the 3D world. Alan Watts, a mystic and spiritual teacher, said it this way. He said that an individual, the true part of who you are, may be seen as the one focal point at which the entire universe expresses itself. I do find it kind of interesting that when we're born, we have no concept of separation. And then over time, we develop this as part of our natural psychological growth. The reason I find that interesting is because the idea of oneness, this idea that Alan Watts is talking about as you are the one focal point at which the entire universe expresses itself, and the other person is one focal point at which the entire universe expresses itself. This idea of oneness is that the the part that says that I am different from you or I am separate from you, that that's an illusion, that the 3D world is an illusion of thinking and senses and and thoughts that make us feel like we're separate from other people when really it is all that same essence. It is all that same source. It is all God. If you're in the new thought movement and are comfortable using that word God for this underlying energy, kind of the what's at back of everything that we see. So I heard it explained a really good way on a podcast recently where they talked about a tree And you imagine on one side of the tree, there's leaves, and on the other side of the tree, there's leaves, right? This tree has tons of leaves. Well, each leaf is part of that tree. It's only us looking at it and saying, well, that's a leaf and that's a different leaf. That's a mental model that we've put to separate those different leaves, but they're all part of the tree. But if you try and imagine having the experience of being a leaf, when you're on one side of the tree as a leaf, you don't know what the leaf on the other side of the tree is doing nor experiencing. You could be in the sun while that other leaf is in the shade. You could need different things at different times. You could have different experiences, but you are all still the tree, part of the tree. So I like that analogy because it's a nice way to kind of think about what spirituality is saying about our existence, about who we truly are, and about this idea that the 3D world is more of an illusion. So the same way that I say like, this is my hand and this is my arm, well, it's all me. I'm the one that's creating that separation. So one of the ways that we can start to kind of befriend our ego is to pay attention to it and ask it how it's trying to serve us. If you think about it, if you think about you as a spiritual being coming onto this earth and being born and having a human experience, the ego is something that you, capital Y, you, capital S self, it's something that you created. 
So why did you create it? So we can turn our attention to these parts of ourselves and the parts of our ego that are acting out in anger or doing things that we don't like anymore or acting out these patterns, refusing to set boundaries, keep going back to that relationship that's toxic, whatever our ego is making us do. If we can turn our attention to that part of ourselves, that part of our ego that is doing that and give it love, give it some acceptance, ask it the question, what are you doing for me? And not in a prove yourself type of way, but in a loving and curious type of way. So this is a big part of that internal family systems process, but it's also a big part of what spiritual circles have been talking about for a really long time. And that's showing love and compassion, not just to people out in the world, but also in our internal world. So if we can love, accept, and thank our ego for all of the things that it has done for us to keep us safe, then we can start to integrate and find some wholeness and be able to step and live more from that core self, that Christ consciousness. Because the ego is kind of all around the outer layer of that shell, if you will, protecting that core us, that core I am, because the ego has learned, these parts of ourselves have learned over time that the world's not safe. And so some of our, a lot of our spiritual growth as we start to get older and mature spiritually and start pursuing these things, a lot of that spiritual growth is about letting all of those parts of ourselves and letting the ego know that it's safe and that the I am, the true self of who we are, that we know that it's bigger than any experience that we have on this earth and that we feel safe enough to let that true self show. And so all the parts of our ego that are trying to protect us and keep that self hidden, that they can relax a little bit. And that's how we start to find wholeness and that's how we start to find growth. And that's important because the truth of who I am, the truth of who you are is spiritual. We are spiritual beings. We are bigger than this 3D experience, bigger than this human experience, bigger than this moment in time. And so the more that we can let our true selves shine and grow, the more that we can transcend the trappings of the 3D world, the more that we can transcend the the illusion of separation, the illusion of being stuck in these bodies, the more that we are able to heal and transform not only our lives, but other people's lives as well. The more that we can shine our inner light, we create ripples across all of the collective consciousness, across all of time and space, across the entire universe, allowing healing and transformation to happen throughout. So it's important work that we're doing and it's hard work that we're doing. The rest of the world is perfectly fine acting from their egos and taking a medication here or there, getting therapy every once in a while, or a lot of times just avoiding it altogether and not doing the work and just living from their patterns of domestication. And that's fine for other people if that's what they're comfortable with because this is hard. It's hard to really look deep into our psyches. It's hard to to find love and compassion for a part of ourselves that we'd really rather pretend just didn't exist. But when we know that the truth of who we are is bigger than transcends and not even really connected to our ego and our patterns and our behaviors, that helps us to feel safer to explore them. When I know that no matter what I find in my mind, no matter what crazy thought or totally sick way of thinking I find in my mind says nothing about who I am truly, then I feel safer to explore it. So I hope this helps you grasp the idea of ego and domestication and our highest self, gives you a little bit more understanding about what those terms mean, and allows you to step further into your path on spiritual growth. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments. If you have any other concepts you'd like me to explore, let me know that as well. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. What other models for understanding the ego have you seen? Let's share together so we can all walk this path together. All right, I'll talk to you next time. Thank you.